It's the streets, Chicago, man. It's a slave state, man. The United States is a slave state. How you think most of us got here, you know? They don't give us no jobs. You know, they send us to jail, put axes on our backs. Every day we do things that we don't want to do, but we have to do it to survive. You know what I mean? It's all set up for destruction, man. You know what I mean? Exactly. That's it. It's all exactly. set up for, for destruction, man. 90% of our fathers went there for us. They probably was on dope or ran off with somebody else. School only took us so far, and it was all on us after that. Either you had a wicked jump shot or you sling crack rock. That was our choices right there. Only positive thing you can do is try to take care of them, your kids. That's the only thing that'll make you a man out here. We live in an era where most of us die young, so we learned to, to really, really enjoy that little time that we got here with each other, because we never will know when we leave. One group has to be at the bottom, and we were just that chosen group. I mean, look at the neighborhood. This the hood. You know what I'm saying? Like an ant farm, ant hill. People going to work, coming home, people raising their kids, cutting their grass. You know what I'm saying? We are society within society, sir. It was never fair to our, own, uh, to our ancestors, man. It was never fair. I don't get it twisted. I don't sell no drugs. Mm -hmm. You know, I got a job, but, you know what I'm saying? I make it look real easy. Aha. Uh -huh. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> we make it look real easy over here. You know what I'm saying? For ain't sure. nothing, you know, ain't nothing to it. You know what I'm saying? I'm about to do it. So let it be what it is. Let it be what it be. This area is too bad out here. The area is too bad, there's too much shooting. They just killed three people over here on Cole last night. It's on the TV. Cole is right here. And it was some shooting last night that my granddaughter had to call the police. But they're shooting over here all the time. And most of the time, the police don't come over here. They catch you coming out your house or going in your house and stuff. It's just silly and ignorant to me. You know, they divide up the city. The gangs, the gangs and the drug dealer. And if they thinking you making a little bit more than it, they want to come over here. And then if you say no, then that's where the shooting and the killing, uh, you know, it, it starts. It's all over. It's all over. So, uh, and uh, they just don't stop. And it just, it's just all over money and power. There's only two things that'll happen to a young man that decides that he wants to be a drug dealer. He's going to prison, or he's going to the graveyard. Those are his only two options. There's, an, there's not another option. It was horrific to sit in a courtroom and hear my son portrayed as this gangster kingpin. I asked my husband at least four or five times, what did he say? Did he say 42 years? Did he say 42 years? Oh, I miss him so much. I haven't seen his face in over five years. A little bit about five, about five years. I was like, well, basically, but what did you do for 25 years? Because the only person people like get like that, if you think is murderers, you know, or rapers or something like that, to get 25 years. And I was really kind of upset um, about that. He was in a gang. He sold drugs. He did what he did. 
The courts and society has convicted my son. I'm not going to convict him every day. First of all, before I begin this letter, Mama, I want to tell you that you are very special to me, and you know that I love you. Thank you for loving me when I didn't love myself. Really, words can express how much I love you, so I just want to say thank you. Chicago is my home. That's all I know. That's my city. I was a graffiti artist back when I was younger. You know, I, sp I spray painted trains and walls, and I stayed out all night, you know, uh, the streets kind of raised me. I was always in the streets since I was young. I would always display that I was a good child. But for hours when I was supposed to be in bed, I'd be watching and listening to the gangsters in the courtyard where we lived in the Jane Adams. I was fascinated by their lifestyle, and I wanted to be like that. I got to a point in my life where I wanted to be a drug dealer. It was hard work, but I liked how fast you reap the benefits. The money I made in Chicago was cool when I first started to hustle, but as I got older, I realized it was just not fast enough. So I decided, like a few others I know, to take my show on the road. I went to several different towns in Illinois, Indiana, Minnesota, Kentucky, and ultimately laying my hat down in Rockford. While I was in Rockford, I ran across my stone brother, Duck, and we decided to work together. Well, at first, it, it was just business. But then, like, then it became, like, Plastic. Rockford was not our home. We were invading someone else's territory. We were foreigners in a foreign land. Like, I never thought they'd go through so much to, to put us behind bars. I never thought they'd go through so much to, to get little old me. I never was a good drug dealer, but for a long time, I was happy because I was one of them gangsters I fantasized being when I was little, seeing them in the courtyard. Truly, in my heart, I do not regret going to Rock. Between about 2001 up through 2005, there was a growing presence of hardened Chicago gang members that were coming out to Rockford and taking over the drug business word began to spread about this guy named Duck and members of the Titanic Stones. We kept hearing his name Duck, that he was from Chicago, that he was putting on a lot of dope here in Rockford. He was just a young guy, but he had a real reputation. People were afraid of him, just a little guy. The talk in the street and informant information was is that this group run by Duck, Titanic Stones, were trying to take over the drug trade in Rockford, and, and they were moving real strong. When they arrived here in Rockford, there was definitely a power struggle, Chicago versus Rockford. We'd have our robberies, our shootings. Uh, there have been murders here. Every so often, somebody comes into power, it's just like anything else in life, you know, any business or any, you know, somebody, something always rises to the top. It was an epidemic, especially what it was. They, they were shooting a lot of people. Random gunfire was taking place, a lot of it directed to housing developments in the city. We were having multiple shots fired during these, these shootings. There was one particular incident that took place on Underwood Street on a Saturday afternoon. There was a, a running gun battle in the middle of the street. There were 60 rounds exchanged. There were 60 casings in the street. And it was a miracle that nobody was killed. I mean, there were children out playing, the rounds were flying, and everything went back to duck. Now we're coming up on Central. We're still on the west side of town here in Rockford. We're going to go by the Auburn Street McDonald's where Julio Allen, a uh, member of an opposite gang here in Rockford, uh, was confronted by uh, Doug Davis, Bradford Dotson. Bradford Dotson, 
who had the nickname of, of Hustler, who played the role of enforcer. Uh, Duck's orders at the McDonald's restaurant at Auburn and Central uh, tried to carry out a hit in retaliation for a home invasion at one of the gang's drug houses. They found out Julio Allen was there. Davis gave the order, and Bradford Dotson fired several rounds through a plate glass window. When you got someone firing rounds inside of McDonald's like that, that's unacceptable. That's when I said, I want this duck. This guy has got to go down. We initiated a federal case. Did an awful lot of surveillance, following people, watching people, talking to informants. We started to see the pattern, the way they were selling narcotics was the same. He was using different locations in the city, renting houses. Normally he would have a lady rent the house in her name. Nobody would live there, they would just use it strictly to sell drugs. The end game for us here was to take out the organization as a whole. The Rockford Police Department had executed search warrants at many of these drug houses and only gotten small quantities of crack cocaine or heroin, uh, almost always heroin, and he was never there. He wasn't the one selling it. We were lucky enough to have a confidential informant who was providing us with a wealth of information and told us that she had been approached and asked she would be interested in renting a house on behalf of Duck and the Titanic Stones. I was selling crack, I was selling dime bags, 20s, eight balls. I mean, I was good at it. I'm not gonna sit there and say I was good at it. I just slipped up one time because I was drunk. I was messed up and forgot to take it out and went to jail and they found it in the jailhouse. Some people say they ain't scared of going to prison. That's a lie. Everybody's scared to go to prison because I was scared to go to prison. I had to make a decision and I had to make it quick. And I'm, anybody in my shoes, anything, would probably would have did the same thing if you really cared about your kids, you know? Everybody called me snitches. Okay, I'll be a snitch. My kids is more important than any of y'all, any of y'all, anybody. My kids and my family come before anything. Duck looks like the coolest person. I'm talking about like the coolest person. You look into it, you be like, oh, he's a low connect, but he's the scariest person. If you get to know him, you see how he really is. He's the dangerous man in period I've ever seen in my life because he's very dangerous. I'm talking about he had more power than Scarface. That's how I'm telling you. That man was big, big. They would have killed me if they found out I brought them down, how I went down. They would have killed me. I'd be dead. I mean, it's a chance I had to take. Get hot, gonna get busy. Get any time off, because I gotta bail all that hay. You still gotta protect the street, too. I grew up in a small town here, real small town. Not even in the small town, outside the small town. Grew up on a farm, raised beef cattle. When I was growing up, I wanted to, I actually wanted to stay on the farm and raise cattle. And, uh, Dad told me that the, the market was going bad with cattle and there wasn't any money in it, so I had to get a job in town. This is where I ended up. He does that pretty gay. Yeah. Beginning of the case, I was working in the narcotics unit and my brother was in the, the gang unit. And we were both working both angles of it. And Barry came to me one day and said, hey man, I got an idea. Do you think this will work? He told me that he had an informant and the informant had been approached and asked to rent a house, and then the house would be used for a drug house. And they wanted to wire the house up with video and audio. And said, yeah, yeah, I think we can make that happen. This is where the house was. The house was donated to us. It was scheduled for demolition. This is the spot right there. And it was pretty much disgusting when we got it, but they were kind enough to just let us do whatever we wanted to do. We parked in this driveway and carried lots and lots of carpeting and junk inside. Well, we chose a location because at the time, the targets that we were looking at were looking for an east side spot. Uh, this is our near east side of town in Rockford. Uh, they were looking for uh, a spot that had alleys 
um, that was uh, pretty much hidden uh, from the uh, general traffic but could be accessible to somebody that wanted to get in and get out. It was boarded up. Every window, every door was boarded up. Inside the carpet was rotten. Uh, the flooring w was a mess. All the utilities were not functioning. We would come over in our undercover vehicles. We would paint carpet, do electrical work, plumbing, just totally redo the house. But we added things to it, um, video and audio. Talking to our technical people, ATF's technical people, we determined in order to do what we wanted to do, we would have to hardwire the house to our listening post. And by hardwire, I mean we needed a cable run directly from that house to wherever we set up a command post slash listening post. Fortunately, one day we were in a room talking and a sergeant from the community relations happened to be in there and he heard the problem and said, I've got just a spot for you. When I looked at it, it was perfect. The factory or command center that we used was an old model paint factory from the, the third or fourth floor, wherever we were, we had a bird's eye view of the house looking north. And the command center was set up so that there was a monitoring room where you'd have three agents at three separate monitoring stations and then a supervisor in the room. And each of those stations uh, monitored a particular room in the house at 1023 Kishwaukee. One for the kitchen, one for the dining room, one for the living room. Nobody could guarantee that after all that hard work that the Titanic stones wouldn't just say we're not interested anymore or that they would think something was up. So there were some tense days leading up to August 9th. But when I took Duck to show him that house today, he loved it. He loved it. I'm talking about he fell in love. He said, man, call that motherfucker landlord right now and tell him you want it. He said, it's low key, it's off of the back in the alley. It's interest for the smokers to come in from the alley and nobody gonna see him. It's two ways to come in from the back way. He wanted it. We didn't even use the front door. He wanted it. He was like, tell him, yeah. So I called, I was like, Duck wants it. He said, he wants it? I said, he likes it. I said, he loves it. Finally, on August 9th, it worked out. And within a very short period of time, a couple of hours, the keys were turned over. And within an almost identical short period of time, they're moving in. Bro, you got to get out, man. like nothing suspicious or nothing like that. The first time I saw it, I just looked at it as another trap. I mean, we had so many. It was crazy one day, because the first time I ever went over there, my girl dropped me off. And when she was dropping me off, she said, baby, I've been staying in Rockford all my life, and ain't nobody never lived in that house. So the first thing I said, well, what the fuck does that mean? see furniture coming in, and Doc, and little Steve, and Bradford Dotson, and Ambrose Jones. They're carrying couches in. They're carrying chairs in. And, and they're setting up shop. That night, they're selling dope. What's up, Steve? Mm -hmm. Hey, 
Y'all all together? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's sweet. Uh, 40. 40 now. 40. What? Four. You know y'all got one. Y'all got to do one. Right? Yeah. yeah, that's what he said. That's no problem. That's no video and audio in a living and breathing drug house and turning the keys over to the gang when you wanted to turn them over, that had never been done before. It, it is really an underclass and subculture that most people really never see. I remember a phone call that I received from Barry Cunningham when I wasn't in the monitoring room. And Barry's words were, we're in the hornet's nest here. Dude, jump out the car here twice. I'm squeezing at his ass. He, he get low. Good boy, he's my son. I jumped out. Right here. He was squeezing at his ass. Boom, 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 boom. Put that little shit up. Got to run. They pulled off left. I've seen no shit like that, boy. Man, come on. That's what you said, millimeter. Ain't no ten millimeter. That's nasty. Yeah, that's nasty. Shit like that. Bomb. Rocky, boy. See them rockets in there. Oh, they should talk like a motherfucker. I've been working narcotics for many, many years and spent countless hours on surveillance, whether or not it's in the back of a van or a squad car, sitting back with binoculars watching drug houses or watching people deliver drugs or purchase drugs. So you always had a good concept of what it was like from the outside, but you never knew what it was really like on the inside. Well, this gave us the opportunity to take um, an inside seat in that drug house and determine exactly what was taking place. I was here from about five o'clock in the morning every morning until midnight, two o'clock every night. It was just miserable hot every day. Everybody was miserable. Everybody was complaining at me because I was the guy who was supposed to be handling the gear and I just couldn't keep it cool enough. It was a learning experience, I think, for everybody there. This is the first time you actually saw what happened in a drug house. They were just living like regular people live, watching TV, playing video games, visiting with their friends. Just that normal life was interrupted by selling drugs and playing with guns and counting money. Yeah, not criminal activity going on, then the court order provides that you have to turn off the recording devices. Most often, everything that was going on in that house was criminal in nature because there was almost always drugs around or a gun in the room. Almost everybody was a convicted felon, so everything was criminal in nature. I mean, it was a pretty simple operation. Whoever was in the house at that time, people would come to the door. They knew the majority of the people coming to the door because of the fact that they were dealing with them on a regular basis. I mean, they would lay around all day long on the couch, 
just waiting for someone to knock on a door so they could sell dope to him. This group was associated with so much violence. Once those microphones were turned on and those cameras were turned on, while there was some relief that it was working, the, the tension didn't necessarily subside because it became very obvious to us that this gang was for real and the reputation that preceded them was one that was appropriate. The last thing in the world we wanted to do would be violence to a neighborhood. I mean, we set this house up. So, you know, God forbid we brought violence into the neighborhood and somebody got hurt. You know, we were always concerned about that, that, you know, that was something that we had to keep in mind and we couldn't let it get, we couldn't let it get out of control. Now it's about to get real in the field. Mm -hmm. Oh, shit. Bring them fully all those out and let us just tear this motherfucker up. Start tearing the motherfucking projects up. It's gonna get ugly. For real. Put your helmet on. Put your 3D glasses on, pussy, because you know we're coming straight at you. <laughs> Every evening, the shit would hit the fan. I really can't think of a better way of saying it. The shit would just hit the fan. Several times, they just jump up and say, "Let's go shoot so and so," and you'd just be like, "Okay, now we got to stop this." And usually, they'd end up talking about it for five minutes, smoking dope, playing X or playing video games, and forget about it. So you didn't have to do anything; it took care of itself. But nevertheless, it was every night, every night. So we got to be just kind of a laugh. We'd all wait around there for come the seven o'clock catastrophe every night. Yeah. 
Hey, yo, man, you yeah. just gonna swallow all this. Yeah. I'm gonna choke this out. You stupid. I'm just gonna be on the floor straight there. <laughs> that shit ain't gonna kill you. <laughs> 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 yeah. He said the best dope is wild. I got you all hooked up together with a boat. You got the best dope this year. <laughs> Gonna play it back like we got the best dope in Rockford, by the way. Yeah. Uh, else we gonna be here in court. We got the best dope in Rock. We gonna be playing this shit. Oh, three P. That looks good. Uh, uh, we got the best dope in Rock. We got the best dope in Rock. I didn't find out the heat started selling drugs. Until I was 17, 16 or 17. Walked in a room and he was cutting it up. So, you know, I was just like, I didn't say nothing. He just told me to get out the room. Not until the feds was looking for him, we really sat down and had a talk. And I was like, my child, you need to change your life. I said, there are so many things you could do I'm like, you can do things that your other friends can't do. I just found out recently some of them can't even read. You know, he could read. He knows how to play the saxophone. And trust me, I used to try to, like, you know, whatever instrument he used to play, I used to try to learn how to do the saxophone. It is hard. All those notes and all that, it is so hard. But his ass mastered the saxophone and can play that goddamn saxophone. I asked him, well, well I said, why? And he said, well, I walked in a room and I ain't never seen that much money in my life. All at once. I never seen, and I wanted that. That's what he said. I wanted that. I used to see my great-grandma. Yeah. And my grandma don't want nobody to spank it and do nothing to it. Ow. Oh, God. This is our little family. Montreal, we love him too, even though he's in jail. I miss him. Yeah, I do too. Let me tell you something that I told Montreal and everybody else in jail. They did not send for you. <laughs> this was your choice. They did not send for you. You don't have to do what you see a little Johnny do, a little Calvin do. You don't have to do this. I know plenty of people that I knew that was doing things wrong even since I've been grown. Did I get out there and do it? No, because I know better. Everybody has a choice. That's including Montreal and everybody else, you and everybody else. We have a choice. Because you don't have to do what the next person do. I'm like me. I am my own model. And a lot of people talking about these basketball players and these movie stars, they try to portray these people as role model. They are not no role model. I am the role model in my house. That's what you should do. Stand up, mother and father, and be the role model in your house. All we have to do is just pray and, and think positive and everything will be okay. Okay, Mr. Shabon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is the first time a child in my family been on the pass of path. I know. <laughs> so hopefully we'll be back uh, home soon. This area is too bad out here. And no more than this train. Oh, my God, I can't go past this train.
if you came to my house when I was growing up, oh, you knew it was a holiday. We be eating like mad, 24 hours, all day, all evening, all night. You could smell the nuts, the cakes, the pies. We had a big pot of chitlin. Then you had a big pan of macaroni and cheese. And then you had a big bowl of potato salad. Then you had a shrimp salad. And you had fried peach pies. You had the sweet potato pies, custard pies, and then great big pot of greens, great big pot of string beans. Salt pork going all through these baked beans and strips of bacon on the top. You ever had grits and chicken? Well, see, that's what my grandmother would do sometimes just for breakfast. We always had food. My house is my life, the memories and the things that uh, I used to do there and the cooking and it's nothing like having something of your own. You don't have to worry about nobody running over your head. And you keep your house clean in your backyard. You can always go out there to cook and enjoy yourself. We were all, might as well say, raised up in that house. The house was my grandparents' house. He was born. He was born there. Letitia in Montreal was born there. Even though it is uh, in the shamble, I feel like I'm at home. And I always go over there to clean up and sweep up. I can't wait to get back over there. When I go over there, I hate to come back this way. Okay. Uh, Hyde Park offers so much that the other areas to me don't offer. Around here in Hyde Park, it's always been nice. You rarely hear about crime happening over here, if ever. But everybody wants to live in Hyde Park because it's quiet, it's considered safe, but it's really expensive to live in here. But this is where Daryl, he, he really grew up in, in Hyde Park because I used to live on 47th and on Lake Park. And we'll go down there as well. And that's where it all started. The ditching school, the hanging out with the wrong crowd. That's where it started. Daryl had a chance. He didn't, he didn't have to make the choices he made. He had role models. Here's Hyde Park Academy. That's where he, that's where he went to high school. It would have been a totally different ball game had I had my act together. I fell prey to the streets. And obviously, you know, he did too. It was interesting and, I guess, disturbing at the same time the, what the customer base was. And there were people from all walks of life, people who looked like they'd just gotten off work at 5, 5.30 and stopped at the drug house to get their heroin fix, people who clearly were well on their way to becoming heroin addicts, young people, teenagers, people from all walks of life. You'd see the soccer moms showing up in the minivan getting dope. You'd see. You know, the hardcore drug addicts, you'd see black, white, male, female, young, old, anything. It was just all over the place. 
You know, you're, many times your victims are not the best citizens themselves, but they're still a victim. How'd they get to this point? They're, they're taking their life in their hands to go to a neighborhood they know nothing about, to walk into a house they know nothing about. There's guys in here with guns to purchase a little bag of powder. What went so wrong in their lives to put them to that point? And this is a small part of a huge picture. How big is this drug problem throughout the world? It's, it's, it's beyond explanation. It's huge. The, the life I had, the hard part, I made it hard. I had an easy life. I, I had a, uh, uh, my parents did the best they could with what they had. Uh, I had wonderful, I have wonderful, loving parents. And although my home was semi-dysfunctional, my parents did everything in their power to make sure I didn't use drugs. Had I not used, would he not have sold drugs? I can't say that for sure. He had a huge influence from his father, and he wanted to be just like Daddy. And Daddy was a dope dealer. He had no respect for me. I was addicted to cocaine. He had no respect for me. But his father, on the other hand, that's who he respected. Duck in the video footage came across as somebody who was always in control. When he walked in, anybody who was in the house sort of perked up, and uh, Duck was there for one reason, which was to, to deliver drugs and to pick up the money, most importantly. Duck was in charge, and nobody else knew who Duck knew. Duck had the contacts in Chicago. When he made a transaction in Chicago, no one was allowed to be with him during that transaction. They'd have to wait in the car. He kept that confidential, you know, that was, that was his uh, ace in the hole with these guys, because he knew one of them would go out and try to make a contact with them otherwise. He needed to re-up or get more crack cocaine. He went into the city. Duck never drove himself. Most often, his driver was Ambrose Jones, somebody who was in his very tight inner circle, somebody he trusted. It was a car that was in somebody else's name, a big black SUV we later found out had a hidden compartment. But he went in and picked it up, brought it back to Rockford, where he mixed it and stored it at his girlfriend's house, away from where he slept or did his business. Anytime one of the drug houses that was being operated was out of drugs, whoever was working would use the Nextel phones to inform him that 
they needed more product. Is that cereal gone? We ain't got no more cereal. Fuck. Talk about that cereal. Oh, man. And then you'd see Duck, driven by Ambrose, go over in that Escalade to the Chestnut Street house, pick up a pack, go to the drug house, drop it off, pick up the money, and then take off. It ain't safe around here. It be shooting, fights, all type of stuff. That's how I know it's bad. It's a gunshot. <laughs> bullet right here. That's how much they shoots over here. <laughs> and we were sitting on my couch, and all we heard was gunshots. I had to jump on the floor like, oh my god. They is shooting. I'm glad my kids wasn't here. Boys just get to, get to fight for no reason. And I knew I'm, I'm like, I feel ever since I got shot, I just feel like I'm so terrified of guns, I feel like I know when they gonna get drawn. I just jumped in my car like, uh-uh, girl, I'm finna go, something finna happen. <laughs> as soon as I said that, dude jumped in his car, reversed, almost hit his friend, and just got to shooting. Oh, took off. <laughs> I got pregnant when I was 18, so I was with him a few years. I was close with him until he got him another girlfriend. He wasn't no bad person, like the streets made it say. He was just out here trying to feed his kids. People got to make it. So that's what he tried to get out here and do. He felt like he had kids and they had to eat. So I don't think it was wrong. Because it's hard out here, and it is. It breaks my heart, and I can't see him like I want to. Yeah, they're my kids. They be want to see them and they can't. I don't know. But when she went locked up, he left me with two kids. That's the only thing I was really mad about. I had two kids by him, then he go get locked up. met Duck in like 96, 97, when our gang was in tour with their gang. They gang was from like 53rd and Harper, and you know we from 52nd and Drexel. So Duck used to come down to Drexel and he'd shoot, and he'd shoot at us. And it's like concrete jumping off the ground, hitting, and his shells hitting up the cars. Because our two gangs was in tour, that's the first time I even heard his name or, or, or knew about him. Man, Duck as a person, man, he was a caring, he was a caring dude, you know what I'm saying? Like, he'll come talk to me about his girlfriend problems. And, that, and that's the Duck that I know. I thought he was my friend. hurt so much for me as I did for Brandon. He has uncles and he have grandfathers and he have cousins and whatnot that could help raise him, but it's nothing like a dad. And he was very young. Um, and having, you know, that's all he know about his dad is in and out of jail. He doesn't look exactly like him, but he has enough of the mannerisms and just his attitude as a whole, like, like his dad. He's very playful, he's very smart, but just does not listen. 
I worry a lot. There's so much gang activity and drug activity in Rockford. And I worry about both my grandsons getting involved and with wrong people. I met Bradford one night. My daughter was picking me up from work, and she introduced me to the guy in the car. This was my boyfriend. I didn't pay him any attention. First time I really, really, other than seeing him in the car, remember being around Brad. It was, I went over one day, and one of their friends says, Martha, I think you need to know Jennifer is pregnant. Oh. After that day, Brad and I became really close because I punched him. And after that, I started taking him to church with me, and I just really grew to love him, and he was just my boy. What's up? What's up? Brandon, did that do? Yeah. Happy birthday, man. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> What'd you do for your birthday? We went to the park. Went to the park. What'd you do? Um, we played. What kind of cake you had? A race car. A race car. You saved me a piece? Huh? You saved me a piece? Nope. Huh? Nope. <laughs> Eight years old. Get big. Brandon, find something to do with positive with their free time. Even at school, you gotta just remember, like, the only way that you will be successful is with an education, Brandon. You okay. gotta stay in school. Okay. That's the only way we're gonna make it. We gotta educate ourselves. Don't spend all your time sitting in the room playing a video game. Okay. Go outside and, and play and, and go to school and just be good. Okay. Well, I wish I was outside playing right now, running around. <laughs> yeah, my son's voice give me strength, man, when I hear it. It don't break me down, like, I don't cry. I'll be, I'll be proud when I, I'm proud of that boy, man, when I hear his voice. His voice assures me that, like, man, I got a date still, you know? When I can able to get on the phone and I can hear his voice and it's so strong and healthy, that's, that gave me power to like, yeah, I can make it out and still be able to kick it with him, you know? The severity of the situation never hit me until and at 2 o'clock in the morning I get a call from the hospital across town that he'd been mugged. And I'm thinking, well, how did that happen? They said, well, we're taking him to surgery. We'll call you when it's over. Nine o'clock the next morning, they called me that he was finally out of surgery. And I talked to the doctor because I had worked at that hospital before. And he told me that somebody had mashed Brad's hands. Just, he said, it's the worst case he'd ever seen. It took him seven hours to put his hands back together. The hands were mashed flat. The fingers were split and the flesh was coming through. All the bones down to the wrist, just mashed, like hamburger. If you look at the video footage from the Kishwaukee house, you see bandages on both of Bradford Dotson's hands throughout that time period. And that is from Daryl Duck Davis. What happened was they suspected, Duck suspected Bradford of snitching on the gang or of stealing money, something that went against uh, Duck and the organization. So Duck gathered up the gang members over at the Underwood Drug House. He had Joel Turner hold a gun to Bradford Dotson's head. Bradford Dotson was made to spread eagle on the floor, all of his clothes off, and Duck took a hammer, and he broke both of Bradford Dotson's hands. He just hit my hands three times on with the hammers. He bought the, it don't take that much to break no hands with no hammer. He hit my, hand, my hands three times. I tell I did steal them guns, though. <laughs> I needed some cash, quick, because I wasn't trying to be around like that, man. I stayed around because he, like, really made me come around. When I got to the hospital, he immediately came and got me from my baby mother's house. When we pulled up to the trap, I was trying to show that I'm not, I wasn't affected by my hands being broke. So I was like, man, help me move this sofa, you know? So we moved the sofa, even though it was hurting. 
I wanted to show them that, like, man, I'm I'm stronger than what y'all perceive. I was scared that if I tried to leave or if I didn't do what he said, that he was going to take me off somewhere and, sh- and kill me somewhere. Flat out, you know what I'm saying? I'm going to tell the truth. I was scared. I didn't, didn't want to die. My middle finger look like a, a high leg that cut too long. You know how to split like that on stone? <laughs> you should see my shit when I got the band aid. <clears throat> this hand right here, Mo, this one for us. <laughs> this one for people got put in the microwave. <laughs> Okay. Bye. 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 I see you later. I'm going over to Hyde Park. Okay. Love you. Love you, boo boo. Bye. Bye. What did you eat for breakfast and lunch? I had some eggs this morning. And for lunch, I had a sloppy joe. Oh, well, that's nice. You didn't have no bacon? No, they don't serve bacon too often. Okay. Well, I'm so glad to hear your voice, and you know, you're doing fine, and I'm doing fine. Yeah. We're just trying to make it, and trying to look forward in you coming uh, back home with us. Uh, and that's all you can do. Oh, you got to go now? Okay, love you. I love you too. All right, bye. Bye bye. Uh huh. It's funny how my life ended up on the road to self-destruction. When I was younger, a kid, I should say around the age of eight or nine years old, I hated drugs and I hated gangs. I grew up in the house with a mother and an uncle who was addicted to cocaine and heroin. In the midst of all this chaos, you have my grandmother who I love with all my heart and soul. She kept a roof over my head, designed the clothes on my back, and made sure I didn't miss a meal. My grandmother provided for me and my sister the best she could. She even did her best to teach me how to be a man. She told me to stand up for myself, to beat the living shit out of anyone who disrespected me. She always tried to keep me away from drugs. And she always said, boy, you see how that shit got your mama, your daddy, your uncle looking like skin and bones? Don't you ever fuck with that shit. And I remember her saying that, them little voices in my head to this day. Oh, I miss my grandson very much. He's always been in my life. I raised my children by myself with no support. My children and my grandkids. That was my choice of taking care of them. That was my choice, because I didn't want to see them in the system. And I did the best I could to shelter them as much as I could to shelter them. I am very much surprised with this, very much surprised. And I'm also disappointed in him being in jail because, you know, as a grandparent, uh, we, don't chose, we don't choose these things for our children or our grandkids. You know, he, he wasn't raised like this here. I punched the time clock. My grandparents and my mother, they taught me to punch the time clock, and I tried to instill this in my kids. You have to work for what you get. I don't know what what went wrong. I think the peer pressure, I think uh, uh, getting involved uh, with the wrong type of type of people, I think that's where it came from. You know, you want to uh, follow the leader, see what it do what it what you see everybody else do. This is how I feel as a grandparent, you know, and I'm hoping that he'll get through this. He'll I get through, it's like my fault. Like, I'm using drugs. You know, he never seen me get get high or anything like that. But as a, as a parent getting high, I wonder, is it, you know, is it my fault? I really feel guilty about this. You know, did I, did I start this? Did I start him, you know, even uh, not sitting and bringing it in around him, but just the idea of me doing it? You do, am I the cause of this? It's an effect, it has an effect on your children. It has an effect on your children because it also has an effect on me as a parent. So I'm sure it has an effect on him. 
I'm very disappointed in you all, too. And you know I speak frankly. All right, but I've tremendously slowed down. I haven't had any heroin in two months. I had started back because I got depressed again. I really think about this all the time. Am I the reason for this? No, I'm doing this. this. I, mean, you, you, you I could be. Influence. It could be all my fault still. It could be my. No. Yes, it could I'm be all my. It could be all my fault. It could still be my fault. Even though you and Dad did everything, me and my trust still respect you. Never embarrassed. Walk down the street. This is my mama. Walk down the street. This is my daddy. Because even though y'all did drugs, you were good parents. You did us good. You didn't beat us. We didn't get raped. You didn't take us to no drug houses. You ain't never leave us, abandon us. So don't feel bad. Yeah, you know, you, you hurt us. But you ain't never did shit to us like, you know, people could say my mama did this to me. Or my mama let this man rape me because, you know, she was off drugs and didn't know. Some children will sell to their mothers or give their mothers heroin and cocaine. That's something Montreal would never do. And see, and, and, and most parents expect their children that sells drugs for them to give them heroin and cocaine or to buy that for them. I've never asked, I've never asked him to buy me any heroin. You wasn't doing it. to get no, he wouldn't do it anyway. He wouldn't give me any money for it or anything like that. He would, he would not do that. But there is a lot of people expecting their kids. We have family members that expect their children to buy them heroin and cocaine. And I'm still wondering, am I the reason for this? I used to be ashamed when my mother had to come up to the school to check up on me or come and get me because I was suspended for fighting or something. I was embarrassed because of how the drugs affected her appearance. One thing I can say about my mother is she never stole from my family though. And she always bought me and my sister clothes and shoes and then got high with whatever money she had left. I never really once blamed them in my head because I was raised to be my own man. I made my own decisions. I still knew right from wrong. No one ever forced me to sell drugs, carry guns, use guns, fuck somebody up, rob somebody. Any criminal act I did, I did on my own because that's what I wanted to do. I thought I was going to die with that pipe in my hand. I really did. But I can sit here with confidence and say I'll never use cocaine again in my life. Cocaine is no longer part of who I am. Hasn't been for a long time. I botched up motherhood. I botched it. I did. Look at my, I mean, look where my son is. I remember very clearly. I had been in my addiction maybe seven or eight years. And Daryl said to me, Ma, I, I know what you're doing. And if you go down, I'm going to go crashing down with you. I didn't hear him. He was crying out to me then. I didn't hear him. I couldn't hear him because I was so deep in my addiction, I could not hear him. I wish I hadn't hurt him. I, I wish that, I, I wish I hadn't hurt him. My child did not have negligent parents. He, he wasn't hungry, didn't miss a day's meal, was not homeless, 
I wasn't a crackhead. Dad wasn't a crackhead, wasn't abusive. I did none of that. None of the things that society say is the reason why these children do what they do. They do it because they want to, number one. And they do it because someone has enticed them. The drug dealers come through and they see easy, gullible young people and they offer them and it, it, it's exciting. You know, the possibility, the rims, the car. I am angry at him for not, I'm actually angry at him for allowing someone to sell him a dream of nothing. And, and I believe that that's what it was. Bradford Dotson wasn't a force or just a brooding, brooding hard case. The shooting at McDonald's, where he did shoot Julio Allen during that dinner time incident, it was just brazen. From the beginning, when I first even joined the, the, the gang, I was being somebody that I wasn't. You know, I wasn't being Bradford Dodson. I was being the hustler, who they wanted me to be, the one that they accepted. They ain't like Bradford Dodson. They liked the hustler. So for all them years, I was being a hustler. I wasn't being Bradford B. Dodson. I got my hands messed up, bandaged up. I ain't got no money. I can't get out of Rockford. We in toy with gang members all over the city. I was just going to try to find a way to get out all the way. I was going to make Doug feel comfortable to the part where, like, he'll drop his guard, and then that's when I was going to make my move to get, to get away. It's like I grow up so much more, I can't be out there like this. So, I don't really want none, I don't got no goals. You gotta want some of this shit this day. Get at it. I boarded the Greyhound bus to Las Vegas. It was like 10, 11 a.m. August the 20th. I was done. My hand was broke. I got me a, I washed the blood off my hands. I had a new start. I was done. I was done. What's up, man? Who's that, Daddy? Mm -hmm. yeah. I cooked the Juicy Lucy you and I were talking about. Mm-hmm. And baked beans, the famous baked beans. Hey, we gonna barbecue what's tomorrow here? Huh? Hello? We still here. We still here. Oh, yeah. What do you miss the most at home? What I miss the most at home? Yeah. Y'all. Well, we know that, but on a day like today. What about changes? What, what kind of changes have you made for yourself? I noticed that the most, the only problem that I really had, my most problem was just being too materialistic. All right. So now that they put me up in here, they only give you, everybody got the same clothes, everybody gets the same amount of minutes. So I know, like, if I was to get a second chance, mm -hmm. I wouldn't be materialistic. Well, you know what? You've already got a second chance. You know why? Why? You're alive. 
And as long as you're alive, you can do better. And when you can do better, there's there's always going to be some improvement. Yeah, when I know better, I do better. That's right. So you have to look at it like that. You know, prisons are, are, are too full of our, our young black men. You know, uh, y'all have got to make better choices for yourself and realize that your family is your family at home and not the family that you you think is in the street. Dad, I'm asleep. Yeah. I looked up one day and I'm in the feds for 35 years. I woke up. That's when I woke up. I went. I just want to be free. I want to hug my children. I want to go to the lakefront. I want to see the fireworks. I want to be at them barbecues, but I got to stay strong. You're still blessed. You're still alive. You're above ground. A lot of people don't get that chance. You understand? Yeah. So now. I make it your mission to teach somebody else. Maybe you can help somebody else not make those same mistakes. Well, that's what it's really all about. Daddy. Huh? This phone's gonna cut off. You see how it's beeping? Right. This phone's gonna cut off in a couple minutes. I think in like probably 30 seconds. Okay, well, you know love we love you. Love you, Brad. Love you. Love you. Love, love, you. love, love you. all y'all. All right, keep your head up and not right. All right. All right, love, love you. Love you. Go. Yeah. I really hate the way those calls just end like that yeah. because you have things you want to say. Hmm? Why'd you keep the house? Why do I keep the house? Because I'm planning on one day fixing it up, and I want to have a place for him when he do come home. You know, the area is nice. My neighbors is nice. You can't find a neighborhood like this. So that's why I want to come back, but surrounded by Hospitals, parks, and oh, by the way, the president, this is the president, Obama's area. He lives in Hyde Park. This was his room a long time ago, Montreal. So um, I'm trying to get it back together. So I don't know if I'll be able to or not. All I can do is try. I think since he's been in penitentiary, I'm not just saying because he's my grandson, but I think he has changed. You know, I've been a parent and a grandparent. Yeah, I feel flustrated and I feel mad a lot of time and I feel disgusted like, like any parent would be. You know, that's me, I really do. Because uh, he didn't have to chose this and now he realized so that he's made a mistake. He realized it. And like I told him, you ain't got no friends out here. I'm your friend. I was talking to my friend, my friend, my friend. You ain't got no friend. What you all doing out there is a money thing, not a friend thing. They don't mix. See, people ain't caring nothing about you. The same people will kill you or have you killed. Because I know how people are. At least he didn't get on drugs, and I'm, 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 I'm glad of that. The investigation lasted approximately six weeks. To get six weeks out of it was more than we could have hoped for. Doc and a number of members of the organization drove into Chicago to obtain more heroin. They were under surveillance in the Chicago area when they became targets of a drive-by shooting. Suddenly, out of nowhere, a second vehicle pulled up alongside Doc and an individual started shooting. The agents in Chicago had to immediately take action, which required them to pursue the vehicle that the shots had come out of. Duck could see these cars suddenly come from nowhere. He put it all together right then and there. He knew he was under surveillance, um, and he suspected other things might be wrong back in Rockford. He then placed a call that we intercepted in the dope house in which he warned the individuals there that he thought he was being followed by federal investigators and that they should be get out of the house immediately. They 
scrambled back to Rockford that night, Ambrose Jones in the SUV, and Duck, we later learned, in a taxi. That was when the jig was up, so to speak, and uh, it was time for us to start making arrests, which is what we did on September 14th. all the violence, just the things that were starting to happen, like, like we knew that was coming, like, prison, you know what I'm saying? I, I knew it was coming, but I didn't picture it coming like that. I would have liked it to have gone longer, because I wanted to find his source of drugs, his supply of money, um, find more about the, up the chain. So I would have liked it to go on longer. Surprise, you never know. Um, stuff like this, you just, sometimes you think things are going to be quick and they take forever. It just, you don't know. After the arrests were made, there were 16 individuals charged. 13 of those ultimately pled guilty, and three of them went to trial. The defendants here received lengthy sentences. The, the leader of this conspiracy, Daryl Davis, received a 42-year sentence. And that trickled down to the other members of the conspiracy and like Bradford Dotson receiving a 35-year sentence after trial, Montrell McSwain a 25-year sentence after trial. The sentences handed down in cases like this are draconian. 42 years for Daryl Duck Davis is a life sentence. He is going to be an old man when he gets out. When a group like Titanic Stones get to the point where they're that organized and are terrorizing the streets, you're left with no choice. Law enforcement is left with no choice but to take them off. He was simply too dangerous and ordered too many violent acts to leave out on the street. Good morning, thank you. We're back to take your order. Okay, thank you. I think it's been five years since we really started a long-term investigation on these guys. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. It's, it's one of those cases, uh, you know, it's a case of a lifetime that you work, really. Uh, you know, this case really made me proud of you, Michael. When you think about it, you know, you have the generations of, of the police, a lot of police families, you know, fathers, sons, and grandfathers were the police. But the same is true on the other side, the, the criminal side. I, I mean, I, again, I've been around for, for many years and um, have arrested grandfathers of people that we're dealing with now. So I've dealt with their fathers and their grandfathers. And it seems like it's just something that just continues on. There are certainly a lot of success stories, and that's not to, to generalize it, to say that everybody that's been arrested is going to continue with a life of crime. But it, there seems to be a pattern there that, it, that it's very difficult to break from. If you look at them individually, how did they get to that point that they're in a house on Kishwaukee Street in Rockford How'd they get to that point in their life? They're from Chicago, they're young guys. What is it in their life that went wrong? They're born into a family where there might not have been a father present, where some of their mothers were drug users, where, where they themselves were, were just put in a situation that they were almost born to lose. Well, I think anytime you see a story end where young men in the prime of their lives go to spend the majority of their time in federal prison, I think that is tragic. They weren't much younger than me. Uh, our paths certainly never crossed in life, uh, but, but we had very different upbringings, very different advantages or dis disadvantages. And uh, y you wonder if a Montrell McSwain or a Bradford Dotson was given the upbringing that I had, for example, if things would have turned out differently. From our standpoint, these are dangerous guys. We had to take them off the street. We wanted them to go away for the rest of their lives. From this family standpoint, they put aside what they did. That's still their loved one. That's their son or their brother. They love them no matter what they did. I think sometimes 
it's not only tragic, but sometimes it's a relief for them because they know what they're doing. Their son or their brother, whoever it might be, they know they're in Rockford dealing dope. There's two ways out of that. You're going to the penitentiary or you're going to end up dead. Every day that the phone would ring or I would hear the siren, I thought, okay, that someone's going to tell me, come identify your son. Because that was definitely the path that he was going down. I could have been a better parent. I know I'm a better person. I've proven that I'm a better person than that. But unfortunately, my son doesn't know me in my present state. And, and that hurts me. Come on, it's raining. It's... Oh, boy. <laughs> my grandchildren. Oh, they're sweethearts. No, no, get in the back, get in the back, get in the back, get in the back. No, Daryl six. And Deshante is seven. Wonderful, wonderful children. Okay, can you give us a pop? Because we don't got that much money. Okay, I'll give you some money. They don't know the nature of what has happened. They just know their dad's in jail. And when is he getting out? Daryl, go sit down. Yes. I want to sit here. You sit over there, please. You want some french fries? Okay. Yeah, it's a joy having them. It, it, it's an absolute joy. I'm getting a second chance at this. Go to the front and say, excuse me, could I please have some barbecue sauce? Can you do that? No, I didn't ask you. I told her. You want another hamburger? crack his too. You see how big this, this part of his hand is? When you go visit him, when we go visit him this summer, look at this part of his hand. He got lumps sitting on his hands. And his hand's been through a lot. And you hate getting off the phone like I do when your daddy calls? I hate getting off the phone with him. That call just ends so Quick. It don't give you a chance to say the last or whatever you might want to say. He do he call you a lot? He do. He calls me um, at least three times a month. He don't call us a lot. He he um he called Granny house. He called Granny's house. Yeah, but I'm a Leo there. I think we should write a letter to the prison and tell them we want more time. They all say, we can't give them too much. We can't give them any more time on the telephone. Here, y'all just take them. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? That would be nice. Yeah. We only got 30 years left, Granny. Maybe so. I'm not mad at the judge and the prosecutors. They they, they, they got to do their jobs. The gavel was hit, you know. The signatures were signed. The jury brought his verdict. It was over with. And he sentenced me according to the United States Sentencing Guidelines and gave me what he gave me. And if 30 years is what it took for me to humble myself, then all is well. I'm not being a real good example to Brandon, you know what I'm saying? Because if he look up to me, I just hope that he don't make the same mistakes that, that I did, you know, and, and put himself in jeopardy for being away from his children. I mean, I had a, I had a couple years before him. They're trying to exchange it for a, a couple of decades of my life. Now that I look back, we made a lot of untaxed dollars, so I can see why the government would be mad and come for us, you know what I'm saying? Of course I regret it, because my, my, my family's suffering, you know what I'm saying? My woman's suffering. My kid is suffering, I'm suffering, I get told what to do all day, and I'm in this controlled environment. 
You know, I'm just taking it one day at a time, planning for the future. Even though they might do wrong and stuff like that, your children are your children. And I took care of my children. I protected my children. My children never had to go across the street and next door for nothing. They'll tell you how I treated my kids. My kids was dressed all the time, were dressed nice, and they were clean. That I saw to it. And my grandkids, no matter what. And I do have a broken heart. And my heart probably be broken for a long time. <laughs> I didn't choose this for him. We all have a choice, and he made the wrong choice. Mm -hmm.